All right, I'm covering Kyle Kalinske, talk to Jill Stein, and obviously it sounds a little hyperbole for Jill Stein to say World War III based on the circumstances of what happened in World War II, and so the irony is that this is World War III based on Israel being the aggressor. But the only reason this is controversial is if you see Israel as representing the Jewish demographic, which it's not. It, they're, they're literally not. They're not safest in Israel. Now, I would. it's debatable whether they'd be safer in America given their infrastructure was like transported there as well. But anyways, the IDF, Netanyahu, they use the Nazi Holocaust to do atrocities to other people. They essentially, <laughs> using them in vain, which is honestly the most twisted thing. So just so, to catch everybody up, Israel, of course, took out a Hezbollah leader in Beirut, Lebanon. Um, and also, it appears like they took out a Hamas leader. Also, months ago, Israel declared a seven-front war on the Middle Eastern region, on Yemen, Iran, and so this is a boiling out of that moment, which I don't really hear people talk about that moment very well, but I think that was the, the second escalation of that moment. Now, I have to read to you a passage from the book Fewer towards the end of this video, which actually um, prophesized this event sort of happening. In Tehran, and this was the head not of Hamas's uh, military wing, actually their political wing, and there were reports that he was one of the guys engaged in ceasefire negotiations. So to kill a guy who's in the middle of doing the ceasefire negotiations would certainly indicate that Israel's not interested in the ceasefire uh, deal. So Iran, to your point, is threatening massive retaliation. As of the recording of this right now, that hasn't happened yet, um, but they're threatening massive retaliation. So if you were in the White House, how would you handle such an extreme situation? And do you view it as Israel effectively trying to drag the U.S. into a much wider Middle East war? Absolutely, because Israel in, you know, in the course of... I don't think we're necessarily being dragged into it. So it looks like it, because Biden took us out of the Afghanistan war. But I just, I read too much and cross-referenced that with online stuff to really let my guard down that America doesn't want to go to war. It does. It continuously wants this. Now, uh, in one of my experimental writings, The Myth of Family, it actually goes into this, how we wanted perpetual war to force the youth to have patriotism and feelings for their country in a time where peace wouldn't cut it. And so we, uh, the military branch and the demographic branch are really almost saying that the youth are under a, uh, a decadent type of peace situation and they need to be terrified in order to have uh, appreciation for their country. This is a fact that this has been orchestrated on our youth in America. 24 hours uh, went on the offensive against uh, Iran because that assassination took place, you know, with the uh, with the inauguration of a new president in Iran who wanted to improve relations with the West. And it's extremely humiliating to Iran to be assassinating uh, a major international leader right there at the uh, at the. Uh, you know, at the ceremony. So you guys tell me, if you think this is a more devastating blow to Israel's reputation, or Israel is already, has already kicked a dead horse with what it could do to its reputation. They've already blown up hospitals, schools, ambulances. Like, they've done it all. So, I mean, maybe this is a... This would be on the level of like a war crime, where war is overall okay, but you step out of boundaries and it becomes a problem, we notice. I would think uh, bombing hospitals, 
would sort of be something we would go, hey, wait a second, what the fuck? For the inauguration of this new president. So Israel very, uh, uh, you know, very effectively burned bridges. Uh, not that there were bridges to start with uh, with Iran, but prevented the rebuilding of any kind of bridges uh, with Iran, uh, basically prevented any kind of moves towards ceasefire by knocking off the lead negotiator for Hamas. Uh, you know, so they took on Hamas, Iran, Hezbollah, and only a few days earlier, you know, had done a... So I agree with her that it looks wrong to do some bombing at a ceremonial event. But at the same time, when you use names like Hamas, you don't really get people wanting to do civil politics. Even, like, even if it's not a, a war zone situation, people are still like, yeah, blow them up, kill them. Like, so people are very, like, reactionary and quick to really see this as just pure civility politics and sort of um, being passive with Hamas. Now, that's not my opinion necessarily, but I can see why, how people could think that from how Jill is talking. Massive uh, bombing in Yemen and, and against the Houthis. So they've effectively mobilized unbelievable firepower uh, against them, uh, really sort of daring uh, the U.S. or cornering the U.S. into having to come to their aid. So, you know, if I were in the White House uh, at this point, you know, I would be reaching out to all parties and make it clear that the weapons flow to Israel stops um, because that will solve the whole thing. This is this is effectively. A so I was also originally on the weapons flow to Ukraine because of its defense against uh, Russia. But I've heard rumors that they're sending mostly their elderly to be killed in war. And if that's the case, that's insanely fucked up. And they're calling their own, essentially. They're calling their demographics. Because for the most part, most countries that are industrialized are aging and shrinking their population is declining, their patriotism, the housing markets, everything is declining. So this is freaking a lot of people out. And this has something to do with uh, the foreign policy situation at the moment. About Israel's very aggressive policy and its expanding genocidal war. So, you know, it, it essentially takes the driver out of this entire conflict to clarify that the genocide uh, against the Palestinians is over. And the president can do that with a simple phone call to Israel, like Ronald Reagan did to Menachem Begin when Israel had chased the PLO, which was the, uh, you know, the terrorist uh, du jour. There will always be resistance. All right. So when Reagan made that telephone call, I've heard this so many times. Kyle made a standalone video about it, but I think it was a contentious moment at the time, and we only realized it was a good move after the fact, because we saw, like, it's history at this point, so we knew we made a good move, but America backing out of an escalation could have caused more deaths, but I'm just saying, not every it wasn't just this, like, wipe your hands off, oh, we did it, America, it was just, there was probably a lot of debate on whether America should have backed out of that situation or not. ...in a vicious occupation and Very at the time it was the PLO and Israel had chased the PLO into southern Lebanon and was committing massacres uh, against thousands of people and that was horrifying even to Ronald Reagan who basically picked up the phone and said it's over and it was immediately it was over. Uh, Dwight Eisenhower did the same thing decades earlier. Uh, so this is this is what the U.S. can do because we're supplying 80% of the weapons, uh, the funding, the diplomatic cover, the intelligence and uh, strategy. The privilege, the white privilege to be exact. So, you know, obviously we know that Israel was sanctioned and created, given privilege by Britain, the Ottoman Empire, and now the U.S. And we know they have 
a type of white privilege because of the oppositional group against Israel, the the black Hebrew Israelites that are mostly in America, a group of uh, conspiratorial African Americans who believe that they're the true uh, Jews, which is it's interesting, but that's how I sort of see how they have white privilege. And so on. So uh, we can effectively end that genocide. And Kamala's remarks after meeting with Netanyahu that you know that uh, she was feeling the pain, you know, uh, it's like just uh, total crocodile tears here. Because if you're truly uh, in sympathy with Palestinian people, you could do something about it. And she hadn't done squat, and now you know push has really come to shove, and we haven't heard a thing. But this is what. The president of the United States can do uh, with a phone call, essentially, can decompress this entire situation and then sit down and actually begin to conduct uh, a real process of negotiations that forces all parties, but in particular the Israelis, because they are the odd man out here. They're the one party to this conflict, uh, you know, uh, centering around Gaza, that has refused to. Um, Okay, so the Jewish demographic really has no say. They were forced into this privileged role and given Israel. Now, most of them want it. They want to be safe, you know, like any other nation. But we made them a target, essentially, because of our religious usury uh, transfer. And so now the Jewish demographic is a target based on our colonial world building. And we've given them the privilege, the weapons, the national security. You know, it's mostly out of our hands. So. Uh, to accept the ceasefire, the most recent ceasefire agreement, it's been Israel who's been uh, dragging their feet. Uh, Hamas yeah. has already agreed to it. So uh, we can. And of course, that. just assassinated the, the main negotiator who was um, pushing for a, a ceasefire deal and was more of a moderating influence vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, as compared to Yahya Sinwar and the military leadership reportedly, uh, Hania was an asset in terms of trying to get to a ceasefire deal. So, clear, but obviously, Bibi has never wanted a ceasefire deal, and he still doesn't want a ceasefire deal. Um, Dr. Stein, what, in your view, would come after the ceasefire? You know, if you, you are president, you make that call, the genocide ends, you're now dealing with a state that isn't even pretending to be interested in a two-state solution. The Knesset just overwhelmingly voted against a two-state solution. Um, you know, the Oslo process clearly dead. So so what then? What comes next to try to secure some sort of a lasting and just peace? Yeah, I think for the first time so, we need to sit down and negotiate. What I heard on the Oslo Accords, Trump was involved in that. And Palestinian leaders were not even invited to that situation. Now, I don't know the context of Crystal bringing us up because Crystal and Kyle are way more uh, up to speed on the history of this. So correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, with the U.S. Uh, uh, supporting a, a true peace process that complies with international law. So that means at the very least, you know, we have to comply with the 1967 borders. Israel needs to end its occupation, uh, uh, not just of uh, Gaza, but effectively its, its occupation, you know, throughout all of Palestine. It needs to remove its troops and the apartheid government of Israel needs to come to an end. This is not going to be simple. This is not going to be easy. And, you know, Israel has the uh, nuclear bomb as well, which is why what's going on at Yahoo, uh, you know, uh, there's no doubt he would use a nuclear weapon uh, if he needs to. And of course, Russia, who is allied with Iran, they also have a nuclear weapon. I mean, they have loads of nuclear weapons. So, you know, this could be a rush into um, uh, World War Three going on here. So we need to sit down uh, as a true proponent of international law and insist that Israel comply. The ICJ, the International Court of Justice, you know, just issued a second ruling saying that all of these uh, things need to be complied with and that uh, the ethnic cleansing, the occupation, the apartheid need to end. And in fact, the right of return needs to be respected. Reparations need to be paid um, to uh, so, ending the apartheid is good. I agree with her completely. 
especially when she says it won't be easy, because border uh, logic will be brought up. Taking down your borders to people you've persecuted and genocided and ruined their lives, and you're going to let your borders down and assume they're going to be peaceful with you. Now, I can see where this civility politics fails, but I also see Jill Stein saying this is a very uh, difficult situation to end the apartheid because of the boiling over of anger that'll be allowed to infiltrate, for better or worse, if it even escalates, which would be good if it doesn't turn into mass slaughter, just protests and acknowledgement, you know, but... I don't think that's how it's going to be. To Palestine. So, you know, international law is pretty clear about what it calls for. The U.S. has never supported uh, international law here as a means of actually solving this, you know, which is why the U.S. is always trying to create some other independent parallel process where we can make our own rules, not only here, but really uh Everywhere, you know, yeah. NATO you try to be globalist and conquer everything. Um, you know, uh, vehicle for establishing uh, policy. Now, humans have always been global because we're nomadic and we travel the world. But the way America does it, I don't mean to sound conspiratorial and like how the right talks about globalism, but we aren't helping. We're putting the world in debt. Say and gaining some kind of support with it. But the, the world is really united right now. Israel's economy is also going down, and its military is having a very hard time right now uh, dealing with Gaza alone. So there's no way that Israel can take on this battle without... So the legal system may be united, the court of justice, etc. But we are probably the most divided in America right now. Never mind the Israel-Palestine situation. Now, she's probably speaking purely for, like, uh, a consilience of the law and other branches of legality. Like, I really don't think that she's talking about the citizenry. That is the battle that it has engaged, that it is begging for. It cannot do that without full bore support from the U.S., which makes it really imperative that the U.S. Uh, stand up now before it's too late, before we're uh, going to be dragged into it, which we should not be. This is a an absolute deadly conflict, uh, which has every capacity to spiral, spiral into not only a major regional, but potentially a, a World War III type conflict that could readily go nuclear, and Israel, uh, Netanyahu, uh, and the fascist government that they have now, uh, it's not hard to envision they're using a nuclear weapon. But let me also just say what, what can be done here, you know, which is uh, to uh, continue the economic boycott, and it, which is informal at this point, but it should be formalized, and the U.S. needs, needs to lay this out. To She's Israel. right. Here's what you need to do. If you're not going to do that, she's right. But at the same time, this will only sound like civility politics, bringing down your borders, shaking hands with leaders of Hamas. Obviously, Benjamin Netanyahu is against the ceasefire and he doesn't give a shit. He's omitting the fact that tons of people are dying for no reason. But nobody is going to bring that up. It's just civility politics with Hamas. This is the surface level debate the flow that people of will see. Is over. Our economic support is over. And in fact, we will be leading and supporting a, a global economic boycott. And you can't, you know, they can't use a nuclear weapon against that. And that's already had a huge impact on Israel. People are you know, are leaving by the droves uh, from Israel. Their tourist uh, uh, industry obviously has has taken a total nosedive. They've had to close down one of their major ports um, because of the, you know, essentially the boycotts and, and the lack of commerce now uh, with Israel. So Israel is in a very difficult uh, crisis right now, and there is no way out of this uh, other than either 
uh, World War III and uh, the use of nuclear weapons, or the U.S. standing up on the side of international law and human rights. All right, guys. All right, guys. <laughs> so, in the book Fewer, which I'm about to read a passage from, it sort of prophesizes this moment a little bit. So this book is from 2004, 20 years ago. So, quote, Is demographics destiny? The question is always with us and often uh, surfaces with particular urgency at times of international tension. Such a view arises with particular potency during each Israel-Palestinian crisis. Israel, we are told, is under the demographic gun as well as under fire from homicide bombers. In the New York Times in 2002, columnist Nicholas Kristof noted that Palestinians bear twice the number of children per woman as do Israelis, therefore making the Israeli settlements in the West Bank steadily less tenable. And so by ending the apartheid, this would actually make it more tenable because you're not forcing them into this tiny segment of land. Okay, but Kristoff was a beaming optimist compared to historian Paul Kennedy, who in the 1980s wrote that Japan would soon surpass America as the world's economic powerhouse. Writing for Los Angeles Times Syndicate, Kennedy wrote that, quote, hundreds of millions, literally hundreds of millions of young Arabs and Muslims will be on the war path as a demographic boiling over yields overpopulation, poverty, young male frustration, to carry out attacks against the West, and Israel in particular, which often, or sorry, which will obliterate Israel or drive it to some desperate action. And as we are seeing right now, terrorism made, or like Hamas, the, the idea of Hamas made Israel do the desperate action, calling out the Seven Front War in the Middle East. This is happening. And so... My take on World War Three is, unless it's just nukes and we all die, I don't think there will be um, the glory and the patriotism and the unity that was post hoc after World War One and Two. Because what do we have to be faithful for in America? There's no affordable housing. Housing, food is pretty expensive. We can't afford to raise our children. We have no time to clean the house. We're in the situation where we're over seizing reproduction and labor and hiring nannies because we have no time to do any housework ourselves. America is literally spiraling. And so the narrative of patriotism coming together like that, that all died that all is out the window now we cannot come together at this point so in britain there was a time during the the blitz and the the uh in yeah and uh, sorry in world war ii and during these times there was actual community coming together to like bake food and like set up like resource shops and just be community-based in the middle of chaos. So this book, this information that is from a book called uh, Humankind by a guy named uh, Rudger, and it's a great book. Um, it talks about uh, the, so children ending up on the island, you know, the, uh, the Empire of Flies. It's actually, it talks about how a scenario like that actually happened, but these children worked together. There was no cannibalism. And so the media loves to promote strife and struggle, but people have always been able to come together, but we were sabotaged somewhere. And so we are unable to come together in the middle of tough times like this. We have been sabotaged. All right. I'll see you in the next one.